I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. I'm finding more power than I've ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. When I say Jesus, I'm talking about Yeshua HaMashiach. We call him Jesus because that's what we've learned in English. And I make sure that I let people understand that I know his name is Yahshua, Yeshua. The real thing is today is we got a lot of meat to cover. And if you're going to be with us online, if you're going to be with us on the conference line, as well as the Zoom, if you come for bubble gum, I have no bubble gum today. I have no soft weight. I have nothing to play with. This is serious business. And today what we're gonna talk about is what does it mean to be saved? How do you know if you're saved? What are you saved from? You know, the religious talk is I'm saved. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm saved from something or I'm saved in something? What does that mean? What, what, is, what is the main thing about being saved? What's this religious stuff about? Does it even really matter? Or is it about going somewhere and somebody taking up an offering and giving you money? Is it really about that you come and you sing? I just sang a song because of the fact we don't have the situation set up where people will come in and sing. And the Bible said, and into his gates with thanksgiving and to its courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures forever. But we are not going to get to the place where we're going to have a whole lot of people singing and they live a wretched and an ungodly life and you're up here popping your gums and you're calling yourself singing to the most high God. I don't care nothing about how good you sing. Whitney Houston could sing better than a lot of people. She sung the Star Spangled Banner, and one time people said that was anointing. She sung it so well, she sold more. She probably made more money off of that song than I'm making in the next five years. Whitney Houston, and she did drugs and lived all kind of ungodly life, but she could sing. Here's the thing. We're going to talk about that saved thing because if we don't talk about that, what's the use of going to what you call a church, coming together in assembly? and all of those things. So what we need to do, we need to go right into the butt naked word of God and let's start squeezing the juice right now. So I'm gonna share my screen. And as I share the screen, we're gonna be able to go ahead and start to work right away. No, no, you're not gonna do that. You pause my screen. Okay, stop the pause, open it back up and let me win. I don't like it when it seems like my, my work is trying to let me lose. Losing is not acceptable. Now we're in there. Play, praise the Lord. If you all will, we're going to talk about being saved. So let's go. Let's start right when God talks about being saved in the book of Jeremiah. I want to go to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse number 8. If you look on the left-hand panel, you'll see where I'm reading from in the authorized version. Can you all see the left-hand panel up there? Or have I there not made it big enough? Did I take my phone off mute? I don't know. I probably didn't. I don't remember taking it off of mute. Let's see. Uh, I don't see it, Andrina. You may have to take over for me. Take over for me. Because it's not showing me the, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the, the thing that's not showing. Sometimes my screen from my phone's not showing and something else is showing. And when my mind is already set now, it's hard to... It, I'm, I'm not ambidextrous in my mind like that. There's another word that people use sometimes they're being funny. You got to press it. Thank you, precious Lord. You're so pretty. All right. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse number 7. Listen to what God tells the prophet Jeremiah to tell the people. Behold, you trust 
in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not? Listen to verse 10. Here's where the Jews come from. And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, we are saved, we are delivered to do all these abominations. The question is, do you think that the Most High God has called us to be able to live a life where we can still steal, S-T-I-L-L, S-T-E-A-L, that we can steal, that we can continually steal from one another, defraud one another, mistreat one another, to lock people up in jail that don't deserve to be locked up in jail, take them away from their families and say, you know what, they're black, they got a record already, we can treat them any kind of way that we want to. Did, do you think that this is what you're supposed to be delivered from so that you can still commit adultery? So that you can still go out and get your, as they call, your freak on with somebody else. Or that you can go out here and fornicate, adulterate, and have sex with somebody you're not married to. And you call yourself, save you, my people. And then you swear falsely. You know you lie. And you swear falsely. I swear before God I didn't do it. And burn incense to Baal. You pray. To Baal. In other words, you're going to find your source of sustenance, your allegiance to someone else, another God, and then walk after gods that you don't know. Then you come together in my assembly and stand before my house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Well, that's what's preached today. What is preached today, if you come and you say a sinner's prayer, and if you confess with your mouth, as they say, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, now you can do anything that you want to and plead the blood of Jesus and say the blood of Jesus cleanse you from your sins. And that is a God damnable lie. The blood of Jesus will damn you if you understand covenant. A covenant is the blood is shed whenever you break the covenant. And him shedding his blood is because we have broken covenant. And by the blood being shed and breaking the covenant, he is now saying that, guess what? Your death penalty is paid if you're in me. That death penalty will also be ascribed to you. But if you don't walk in me and in my righteousness, You'll die for yourself. You pleading the blood of Jesus? And you're not scared? It's because you don't pay attention to what the Most High God has done. You're not paying attention to what has been said. Now, one of the things that I need you to understand is Romans 10, 9, and, and 10 is what people come to. So I want you to look at Romans 10. I thought you said something. I'm sorry. Romans 10. Verse number nine, I want you to look and see what Romans 10 verse nine says. It says that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The real issue is not is he saying you shall be saved, but what does that mean? What does it mean to be saved? Does it mean you're saved from something or you saved in something? Now, when we read in Jeremiah, the people said, we are saved so that we can still commit adultery. We are saved so that we can still lie. We are still saved so that we can do everything that we're doing because we are in covenant with you and we can do these things and you save us and nothing can happen to us because we are saved. We are delivered to do that. I want, I want to give you some facts about Romans. And I, want, I don't know if you ever thought about this. I'm going to go back to my other panel. I got it written down. 
I could remember, I could give it to you from memory, but just in case I forget one of the little numbers that I have, I want you to, to look and see how I feel about Romans. In Romans, the book of Romans is a book in the Bible. Yes, it is. There are 929 chapters in the Bible. There are 23,145 verses in the Old Testament, 260 chapters in the New Testament. Romans is in the New Testament. There are 7,957 verses in the New Testament. This gives a total of 31,102 words in the New Testament. Okay, that don't mean that much to you. In total, there are 783,137 words in the Bible, the King James Bible. I want you to listen to this one. The number of letters and characters, what we call in the Bible, the letters, over 3 million. How is it then that somebody can take the book of Romans, one verse, Romans 10, 9, and 10, we'll just say Romans 10 and 9, and say that this explains the whole totality of salvation. When you have 7,957 in the Old Testament, I mean in the New Testament, and uh, 23,000 verses in the New, you're looking at over 30,000 verses, and you're going to say one verse in the Bible explains salvation. I got a problem with that, okay? Let me give you the breakdown. In Romans, I want you to look. When you look at Romans 10 and 9, there's 29 words in that verse. And you're going to tell me that this is the whole thing about salvation. In Romans, I did the math on that. And you can see up there that when you divide the 29 words by the 9,422, uh, 9, it's 0.003% of what, I mean, thousands of what's in there. But what I want to do without going any deeper is let you know there's 433 verses in the book of Romans. And you're going to tell me that that one verse has no other attachments in it in the scripture. No other books allude to it in the scripture. And that that scripture means that you're saved. Not even, we already talked about many times before that Romans 10, you cannot understand Romans chapter 10 unless you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. That's not where I'm coming from today. I'm coming from a totally different angle today. Why am I coming from a different angle? Is because I want us to understand what's going on in Romans. Okay. When it says in Romans 10 and 9, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Is that what salvation means? I want you to understand that there is something that you're being saved from, but this Lord part we got to deal with. Let me click back over here so those that are looking on the screen with me, they can see what I'm looking at. Because all of this stuff here, and when you put it out, you got to try to, I have to try to put it out where somebody can see it. These two words here, confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus. This is covenantal talk. Please understand me. This is not just saying, Lord Jesus, help my child. Lord Jesus, I'm tired. No, this is covenantal talk. And when I say covenantal talk, I mean explicitly that when you're looking at Rome, when he was writing to the people in Rome, he's writing to the people of Egypt. I mean, not Egypt, Israel that had come out of Egypt. They knew what Lord was. So let me give you something according to the gospel of Caesar at that particular time so that we will understand what they are telling the people when they say Lord, okay? Now, the gospel according to Caesar Augustus, they found an inscription in Priyun in modern day Turkey referring to Caesar Augustus say, it says, the birthday of Augustus has been for the whole world, the beginning of the gospel. Remember gospel is not just necessarily a biblical word. The word was used before it was ever used in the Bible. It is the beginning of the good news. The word here is euangelion. It says concerning him, praying 150, 40, 41. This inscription found on a government building dating from 6 BC, here is more of what it says, which gives us an insight 
as to how they understood the gospel concerning Caesar Augustus, the most divine Caesar. We should consider equal to the beginning of all things. But when everything was falling into disorder and tending toward dissolution, he restored it once more and gave to the whole world a new aura. Caesar, the companion, I'm, I'm sorry, Caesar, the common good fortune of all, the beginning of life and vitality. All the cities unanimously adopt the birthday of divine Caesar as the new beginning of the year. Whereas providence, which has regulated our whole existence, have brought our life to the climax of perfection in giving to us the Emperor Augustus, who being sent to us and our descendants as Savior, sent to us and our descendants as Savior, has put an end to war and has set all things in order, and whereas having become God, manifest Phineas that means appearance, Caesar has fulfilled all the hopes of earlier times. When these people confessed the Lord Jesus, they weren't just running their mouth. They were going against a covenant. They were going against a covenant treaty. And in order for me to make sure that we understand what's going on, I got to make you understand a little bit about covenant. Now, I'm going to give you some things. I'm going to read some things, but I'm going to kind of tell you first, whenever God set forth the earth, he made sure that Adam knew he, who he was. I mean, you say it was obvious, but he also made it known because he told him what he could and could not do and that he was in control. Once a covenant is made, you have two, you have two entities in a covenant. One is the suzerain. Suzerain is the sovereign. Suzerain is the one in charge. And then you have the vassal. The vassal is the, you have the overlord and you have the underling. Is that easier to understand? The overlord and the underling. But I want to make sure you know that you've heard the terms. So somebody pop out with that one day, you know what they're talking about. Because sometimes people try to talk over your head. So Adam knew who God was. And not only did he know who the Most High God was, he knew at that time there was no one that you should listen to above me, not even yourself. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat, you shall surely die. Adam, I need you to understand that I'm in control. You listen to me. Your thoughts do not get to override. I've given you permission to do everything except what I, pro what I prohibited. I only, I gave you access to everything. I only prohibited one. Unlike the United States, the United States and other countries, we prohibit everything except for what we license you to do. You better look at the difference. You got to get a license for this. You got to get a license, not with God. Then he gave Adam laws. He identified himself, who he was. Adam didn't have a long history. He showed him everything, let him name the stuff, knowing that he's in charge because you're allowing me to do it. And I give you what I call restrictions on my law. Then he brings Adam to the place where he gives him, he enumerates blessings and curses. Adam, I'm going to allow you to be over the whole world. I'm going to allow you to have dominion over the earth. You're going to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. You're going to be the father of all of these. You're going to be all of that. But Adam, I got a sanction. If you go against me, I'll put you to death. And without knowing it, God had a hierarchy to enforce what he's doing. Let me help you to understand because you may not see how this fits with us today. Those of us that live in the United States, we're under them. We're under the laws of the United States. They operate as a suzerain. They operate as an overlord. How do you know that? Because what we do is we'll make laws. 
will tell you that there's no other government but ours that you can adhere to. You don't go and you can bring Chinese law over here and you do that, or you bring the law of your culture over here and do that. Whatever we tell you, that's what we're going to do. And we have made ourselves to be your Lord and your Savior. If you don't understand that, we'll show you. We claim that we have a history. We wrote in the Constitution. In that Constitution, we will let you know what is and what will be, how the laws will be set up, and you are, we're going to give you sanctions. If you don't go, if you don't do what, what we say, we're going to give you blessings and curses. If you do what we say, we'll bless you. If you don't, we'll do curses. We have a hierarchy. We have a military. We have the police. And that's throughout your Bible. That's throughout the history of the world. If you were to go in when we're not doing class, you'll see there are suzerain treaties all over the world with Africa, China, Asia, Belgium. You see the Hittites, the, all of those things. They learned this from God. So when you start looking at Romans 10, 9, and 10, what you see is he is Paul is telling these people, break your allegiance from every other thing and say that you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Let's go back with the other illustration. When the children of Israel was in Egypt, they were under Pharaoh. They were Pharaoh's people. Pharaoh was the God in Egypt. Folk that don't know that, they don't know he was supposed to be the son of Ra and that he was God. He had he has had his rules, his regulations for them to follow. Not only did he have his rules and regulations for them to follow, but he had a hierarchy for them to follow his law. He had taskmasters, he had all these other people that would do things that make you follow his laws. But if you followed his laws, you would be, you'd be, could be at peace. If you didn't, they could kill your children, they could kill you, they could beat you, they could make you do any kind of work that they wanted you to do. Yahweh, God, he tells Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son. Let my son go that he may serve me. My son is going to be in covenant with me. And without going through all that he did, I just need you to understand when he destroyed Egypt, he comes and make covenant with Israel. And he tells them the first thing, I am the Lord your God. I brought you up out of Egypt. Notice who I am. I'm the sovereign. I'm your, I'm your new king. I'm your new sovereign. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of the land of bondage. So here follows, I give you the preamble, who I am. Now I'm going to give you a history of who I am. Then he tells them, you will have no other God before me. That's treason. They have another God before me. I'll put you to death for that. But then again, if all you know is Romans 10, 9, and 10, or Romans 10, 9, you don't know Deuteronomy 13 where he said, I'll put you to death for serving another God. You don't know that because you let somebody tell you that Romans 10, 9 is the totality of being saved. So now when he says, I'll put you to death, then he gives you laws. That's what Exodus 20 is about, is giving you laws. They have no other God before me. Don't make a graven image. Do not take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother, etc. I'm giving you my laws. I am the king. You are going to be in covenant with me. Then, after he does that, he sets up an order for people to carry out his will in the earth. With Adam, did he set up people to go? What he did, he called those cherubim. And those cherubim went out there with flame and fire to enforce what he had to have done. In the case with Israel, he had a priesthood. And inside the priesthood, he had another priesthood. But he didn't limit himself to that. He has other sons, celestial beings. And sometimes they would intervene. Then he gave them sanctions, blessings, and curses. Blessings if you do what I say. Curses if you don't do what I say. And then he had witnesses to that. He had the tables of stone that he kept in his house. And normally they would keep a covenant, uh, a covenant in the house of the overlord. But since the overlord was also the place where they worshiped, both tables would be there. That's witness. Then he had the witness of the people. Then he had the witness of heaven and earth. And he had the witness of the two mountains. That's why you can see in Isaiah, he calls the heaven and earth to witness that we were in covenant. This is what it meant when he saved them out of Egypt. They entered in the covenant. They were professing him as Lord. 
They were professing him as savior. Jesus is mean savior. And with those sanctions that he gave, although he saved those people, the ones that turned away and broke covenant, he killed 645, I mean, 605,000 of those people and left them on the ground in the wilderness. Well, I understand somebody said, but Tim, Tim, this New Testament, really? We're going we gonna to walk and see. So if you look on my screen in the middle, I kind of went through it with you. You see where Moses had a Moses had a covenant and a suzerain vassal covenant, suzerain overlord, vassal underlord. And I showed you where in Exodus 20, he gave them who he was. He went through the process with them. Then he reminds the people who he was. I'm giving you this again because you, you may not remember it. I don't think that you will. This won't be the only time I ever cover this. But it says, 30 gave the stipulations or his laws for the recipients of the people. And then he comes in and lets them know where to keep these covenants, where they would be. And then he had his witness against them. And then he told what would happen. So when you look, and if you've done the reading that I've done, you'll realize all nations do this. That's why when you hear the United States put a sanction on somebody, Either they're in covenant with them or they're in some kind of treaty with them or they're coming in as a bully to stop them from doing something so that they're still acting in the position of an overlord. And so when they would say Jesus is a Lord, that's big talk. Caesar was supposed to be Lord. And so when they did that, they were going against what we would call the status quo. Very good, Tim. I'm glad you covered that. Did, did, was any of that clear? Thank, thank the Lord. We're going we're gonna to be covering this a lot of times because we need to understand we got a kingdom. We got a kingdom and we have an overlord. If we act like we don't have a kingdom, we think in getting saved means we come in here and we're going to be saved. No, we're being saved from the kingdom of darkness and we're brought to the kingdom of light. And the kingdom of darkness has its rules, its regulations, it has its sanctions. If you don't think it has its sanctions, you go out there and say the wrong thing about the wrong president. You go and say the wrong thing about a vaccine. You go out and say the wrong thing about certain things. You're going in the government, you can lose your life or you can lose your freedom because you have said words that, equal, that are equal to blasphemy. If you don't think the world is operating on a religious system, whether or not they call it religious or not, and religious systems are based in covenants, then what has happened is you're just going to church and you're not following the scripture the way the scripture is written. Now let's go sweet to, back to the sweet word of God. I've explained things in covenant because I did not want to take all day, but I want you to understand what are you saved from? Let's go to Romans chapter five. Because most people think you're saved from sin. Okay, if you say that you're saved from sin, that's, that's almost the equivalent of a man looking at a woman call her a piece of meat. Okay, whatever piece of meat you want to call it, piece of hamburger, steak, or whatever you men want to call it, okay? She's more than that. She's more than that, if she's of quality. And if you think being saved only means being saved so you'll go to heaven, you, somebody's told you, giving you the wrong thing. God told Pharaoh through Moses, you let my son go that he can serve me. I want to clear this up right quick before I, before I do this in Romans. Let's go to Ephesians first, Ephesians 2 and 8. I want to clear this up because if I don't clear this up, what will happen is somebody say, well, I, I, I think you're saying the wrong thing. So let's make sure that I can get rid of that. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. People have the nerve to say that that means you don't have to obey God. That's a God damnable lie. He's the suzerain. He's the overlord. You don't get to tell him and do what you want to in his kingdom. Ask Adam. Ask the children of Israel. In 722 BC, they were taken into captivity to the northern kingdom. 605, 586, and all those three deportations, they took Judah into captivity. And look at we black people over here in America. You don't think we're under a curse? When they could take our women and rape them and then bring them back to your house, rape our daughters, cut our penises off, burn us on the stake, lock us up in jail, 
and do whatever they want to to us in jail and make us work for free and often we are not even guilty and you got to pay a whole lot of money to prove that you're not guilty. That's not justice. God's kingdom reigns in justice and righteousness. It doesn't reign in legalities. You don't want me to tell the truth, but I'm going to tell it anyway. I want to die anyway, right? Yeah, I am. I'm already 60. Don't have 60 more to go. I want to be able to die telling the butt naked truth so that when my Lord meets you, you say, that's right. You turned it around. You said what I said. Good enough for me. Because it would be good enough for everybody else. Because I'm going to talk about today. A lot of times people think people saved because you can get along. You're not saved because you can get along with people. You saved because you're in covenant with the most high God. But look at what it says in verse number 10 in, in Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Look at the word there. You look on the bottom of the screen with me while I go to the Greek route down here. It says agathos, good, ergon, works. He didn't save you to go to heaven. He didn't save you so that you can think you're going to grow wings when you die. You're not going to grow wings. I don't care how many songs you sing. I many times you say, ah, I want two wings, two wings. Let me just say that. So I can. You're not going to have six wings. Those were the cherub, I mean the seraphim, and those are serpentine, snake-like beings in Isaiah chapter 6. They're the ones that had six wings, two wings to veil their face, feet, feet, face, and, and they could fly away. The cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 1 had four wings. There are some on the Ark of the Covenant that had two wings. Humans don't get wings when they did the most high Jesus. Did he die? When he died, did he grow, come back with wings? No. Our body is going to be like his body. Our body is going to be sown in weakness. It's going to be raised in power. It's going to be sown mortal. It's going to be raised immortal. When you're talking about you want some wings when you die, how are you going to change it to another kind of being? You're crazy. Listen to folks. That's the Catholic Church drawing stuff on the wall. The same people that sold us with the Portuguese, the same people that did the doctrines of discovery and took our people and took the children from the parents and sold them and sent them to Barbados, St. Thomas the Virgin Island and sent us over here. You're going to follow the Catholic Church. You're going to follow the butt naked word of God. You got a choice. You got a choice. Most time people serve the Catholic Church anyway. That's why they do Christmas and Easter. They don't want to hear me say it, but do I, do I care? I'm in covenant. Now, I just wanted to say that it said we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. I don't know if people know the word should. It, that's a word that means you are obligated. If I say I should pay my rent or I should pay my mortgage, let me not pay it enough and you'll see what happens. Somebody else will have that property. Should. Now let's go back to Romans. Because I've, I've, I've made my point. Romans where it says that if thou confess with thy mouth the sovereign, the suzerain, the overlord, Jesus, Yahweh is Savior, and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you'll be saved. That's not what people get to hear. What they get to hear is religious talk. So what are you saved from? Now we can go to Romans chapter 5. Because I feel better now. Because I, I, I won't explain stuff that has bothered me for the longest. And I grew up in a church where they didn't ever allow me to teach. That's okay. The most I knew how he would let me get ready and prepared and do study. I want you to look at Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. You all ready? Y'all ready for the Bible study? Bless the Lord. The Bible says, wherefore as by one man... Sin in and into the world. We're talking about Adam. For those that don't know, I know you all know, but I'm just going to say it because we have multiple platforms. Wherefore, it's by one man's sin in and into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. If you're saved, you're saved from death. But people say you're saved from sin. They are inextricably tied together. Let me use a different word. They are linked together. Notice what he says. 
as by one man sin, notice sin entered into the world and death by sin. That's what God told Adam. Adam, you were in covenant with me, but if you break, if you break, if you don't treat me like I'm your sovereign overlord, if you don't pay attention to the sanctions that I set, although you are here, Adam, you are saved. Adam, you are delivered from evil. There is no evil. Adam, you have life. There is no death from you at all, none. And so, Adam, by you being in that position, you get a chance to know what's going on, Adam. But you see it, and the Bible says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all for all of sin. Listen to verse 13. It's very important. If you want to know what being saved means, it says, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed. I'm going to do this. I'm going to open up ESV because I do know and in a few minutes, it'll probably get to where it'll say something and it'll be confusing. And I don't want people to say, he just made it say what he wanted to say. It says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed. Look at this over here in 13. Sin was in the world. Before the law was given, but sin is not counted. For those that don't know what imputed means, that's why it's all that. It's the only reason I went over there. Sin is not counted where there is no law. Listen to verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned. Death, instead of life, instead of God reigning in your life in covenant, you now made a covenant with death. Death, look at the word R E. I-G-N-E-D, reigned. That's term for king. Tim, you ain't got to say it. Click. Look down here. The word reign, basileo, that's the Greek word. It means to reign as king. Mm -hmm. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. You want to know what you're being saved from? You're being saved from that king. You're being saved from the dominion of death. You're being saved. This is what being saved means. You want to know if you're saved? You need to understand what's going on here. It ain't about you coming and you singing. You can sing till you're blue in the face. Most time I find people that like to sing in church, like to be in praise groups and all that. They don't live a righteous life and they'd rather sing than to hear the butt naked word of God. I say it in a different voice. Most people like to sing and be in a choir more than they like to hear the word of God because they get a chance to perform. So they get to sing. But in Amos chapter 5, verse 20 through 23, he says, I don't want to hear your songs. Let, let judgment and righteousness flow. This is what, this is the gospel. They said, the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. There is no peace unless there's justice. And that's why they were calling Caesar God. That's why they were calling him Lord, because they said he brought peace. If you study the history, they call it Pax Romana. Pax Romana means they had those roads made, and if you had an uprising, they would send troops, squash it. Send troops, squash it. You could go through the streets or wherever you're going, and people are not going to be robbing you like they used to, because I'm going to squash it. He was like a prince of peace. Peace is not made by you going and saying, you know, I, I, I like you, I forgive you. No. Peace is made by force. And since peace is made by force, an individual must begin to understand that this is the way things happen. Okay, so now it says, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who was a figure of him that was to come. Those that didn't even sin like Adam, they were still under the death penalty. Look at verse 15. But not as, I'm gonna read over here in ESV. It says, but not, I'm saying, but the free gift is not like the trespass. The trespass was when Adam sinned and brought death. The free gift, I want you to keep noticing the free gift. The free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Let me make you understand. He didn't have to send his son. He didn't have to send his son to pay for the sanctions of the curse 
that was brought on mankind because man had sinned. That was the free gift. The free gift is through grace. The free gift is a part of grace. But don't just think that the free gift is grace unless you're going to do what the free gift says because the free gift is going to be the Christ and the Christ has rules. He has regulations. He is king. He's not chump. He's not your buddy. He's not your ace boom coon. And like some people say, he ain't your dog. You know, what's a dog? He's not your dog. He's Lord. Where you get that from? Philippians 2 and 5 said, Christ he humbled himself unto death. He became obedient unto death. Wherefore also God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. He's king of things in heaven, king of heaven, things of earth, yes, and under the earth, all three realms, he's king. He says, the grace by one that abounded to many. You don't think it was a free gift when God brought them out of Egypt? What did they do to earn it? but they still were obligated. You don't think that was God's grace? Moses, I hear them crying. I heard it, Moses. I hear their tears. I hear their crying. I need you to take this for me, Anders' phone. And uh, I, 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 I know it's working, but I, somebody was trying to get in and they can't get in. And I wanted to, um, to be able to give that person the opportunity to have the conference line and I couldn't do it. I have a hard time doing three things at once. I'm in a short bus and doing that. So Gary can text that and, and send the conference line to that, to that person there. So it says the free gift, look at back. It said the free gift abounded to many. And it says in 16 and the free gift, we're talking about the Christ. Most people reduce that to just being grace. If the free gift is just grace and not the Christ, then you should be able to have the free gift without the Christ. Am I correct? But if you got the Christ, how can you not have the free gift? Again, Paul is writing to a people that would have understood because remember, this is really tied to Deuteronomy 30, but we're not going to Deuteronomy 30 today. It says, it's not like the result of one man's sin. Please notice, one man's sin brought the reign of death. The free gift of Christ, it will abound to many. It says, notice, it says, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. Adam's sin brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespass brought justification. He's going to explain. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned. Are you, are you looking at what Paul says? Please follow me. Because Paul uses some words of phraseology that we don't use. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned. That's what we, I'm saying. We're being saved from death, sin and death. He says if by cause of one man, death got the reign and you need to be saved from that. He says through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign through life through the man, Jesus Christ. What he is saying here is, death once reigned through Adam. Christ is taking the place of Adam. That's why 1 Corinthians 15 calls him the last Adam. Through this man's obedience, through this man's obedience and he being your king, if you follow this king, you will reign in life. Somebody said they didn't say that. I said, that's why I made a big point you only read one verse when you read Romans 10 and 9 out of 433 verses, 19 words out of how many thousand? I'm not going to go back to it, but you can go back and start the, uh, the thing over and see it yourself. Verse number 18, listen. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. We want to talk about what it means to be saved. Does that anywhere look like all you're doing is saying something with your mouth? Does it look like Paul is telling you how it works? And I want you to understand, Paul is telling these people how it works. And I'm in chapter five. Unless a person is in the short bus, 
but they're not paying attention. Chapter five will take us to chapter six. Chapter six will take us all the way to 10. So when you get to chapter 10, if you erase everything you said in chapter five, you can come up with a new construct of salvation. It's not, it's not righteous to do that. And it says, again, I'm gonna read it again and then we'll go down to 19. Therefore, as, therefore, as one man trespass led to condemnation for all men, that's to death. So the act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For well, as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. See how, do you see how the sinner and the sin and the death go together? That's why when people say they're saved from sin, but what does that mean? I don't really care if I'm saved from sin if there's no punishment with it, would you? If you're saved from sin, no punishment, you still get to go to heaven, right? And it would, you know, people may not agree with what I'm saying, but look how they live. <laughs> look at how they live, okay? You can still live any kind of way you want to, but sin and death are tied together. So it says, so by one man's obedience, notice what it says, this is going to be important a little later on, by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded more. The law came, remember he said, where well, there is no law, there is no sin. It's not counted. But he said, but nevertheless, I, I, I need you to understand something. If there was no law, how did death reign from Adam to Moses? Paul is saying that there was a law. Moses hadn't come on the scene. But if there was no law, Adam couldn't have died. If there was no law, Cain couldn't have died. Abel couldn't have died. And all of those people in the flood couldn't die. So Paul is saying, where there's no law, there is no sin. But Paul says, nevertheless, people still died. In other words, there was a law there. And he said, because of that, death reigned. And so now he says, so as sin reigned, wait a minute, I'm going to give you this a little bit. Now the law came to increase the trespass. So now I started giving you more and more things in the law so that you can see how far away you are from me. It will increase and show you how worthy you are of death. It says where it says where sin increased, grace abounded the more. Grace is not separated from the Christ. He'll explain it. It says so that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness. Notice, grace also might reign in righteousness leading to eternal life. This is what you're saved from. You're saved from death. I can say sin, but sin and death. Why do you think Christ said, he that believe on me shall never die? I'm coming to save you from the penalty of death. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, it says, the last enemy that will be defeated is death. We think it's an easy thing. I, I walk down, Billy Graham say, come to Jesus and I just, just say the sinner's prayer. You just come down and, and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and go to the church of your choice and, and you go back to the church of your choice. And, and Billy Graham, he's the greatest evangelist of all time. He preached, really? How much did he ever say about the things that they did to us and the laws that are still against black people on the book and the people that you got working, cleaning up the yards and the things like that in the streets and the people that's working in Angola and the people that do all this in the prisons that are innocent. You're going to tell me you're the greatest evangelist ever and you don't teach the righteousness of God and the judgment of God and that you got lands that have been taken from people and you never mention it. And then people tell me, Kim, just preach Jesus. Just preach Jesus. What Jesus? Let, 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 me, let me straighten that out right quick because people got the tendency to have the tendency to say, hey, you know, just preach Jesus. You're telling me a goddamnable lie. I don't know that Jesus. Maybe he got blonde hair and blue eyes, wear a dress and walk real soft when he walked. That ain't, the, that ain't the Jesus I know about. Listen to this Jesus. I'm talking about Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Our people know these verses, and we're going to keep saying it today, lock into our brain. Isaiah 9 and 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be on his shoulder. He will be the suzerain. His name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor. In other words, when you got a defense and you need a defense, when you need to know what to do, counselor, mighty God, he can back up what he say. Everlasting father. He's the father of eternity. Prince of peace. Prince 
of peace. He makes peace. I don't come and say, I'm sorry, I apologize. Oh, believe me, I do. No. I take and turn over your table. I take my cords and I do what I need to do. And if that's not enough, give me time. I'll come on a white, I'll come on a white horse and I'll have the sword coming out of my mouth. I'm going to do my thing. Verse seven, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice. Look at it to establish it with justice and righteousness. If you're going to be the greatest evangelist ever and you don't want to talk about justice and righteousness, you're not great. You're not preaching Jesus. This Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. This is his way to establish it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of Yahweh of armies, the Lord of hosts will perform it. So don't go telling me just preach Jesus because I want to know which Jesus you're talking about. I'm talking about the one that's over. I'm talking about the one that when you say you confess him as Lord, you confess in this as sovereign over your life. Am I clear? Oh, I love it when I'm clear. Now, we were at, I don't want Romans 10. Let's go back to Romans 5. They'll be moving too fast. I don't see it. That's okay. I'll put it back in. I know how to get to it. Romans number five, I think we were about 20. Let's see how that looks. It says, I'm looking at 21, so that as sin reigned unto death, that's because of one man. Yahweh is very consistent. Also, it's a grace also might reign through the righteous lead to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want us to understand that righteousness there. When you talk about grace and you talk about righteousness, I need you to understand it's talking about punishment. Look on my right hand channel, on the channel over here. You see that word here? Let me click it up for you. Dikaiosine. Yes, the Greek word, okay? That word is talking about punishment and justice. So we're talking about because of what Christ did, his taking the punishment, being obedient it leads to eternal life through him, our Lord. And what I did was I said, Tim, make it where you will be able to show that. And I'm gonna show you all how I did it cause I just clicked on it, but I need you to see it just in case somebody think I just made up something. I left click on that word righteousness. Here is the lemma. Yes, Gary. You're saying that the word uh, righteousness right there means both that's what the de that's the definition of it okay so what i'm doing is i'm going to the lemma the word you would look up like if you want to look up run, running you got to look up the lemma run okay so i'm going to the lemma and then i'm coming down here to what is called the morphology the part of speech and this is how i got that right there so i'm not going to go through the whole process i just want you to see how righteousness is used so that we don't get confused because some people think of righteousness is only as an act that is done and there's nothing for us to do. As if, the, as if our sovereign, he's done everything and we do nothing. So in Matthew 5 and 10, all I'm doing is looking at the word righteousness and show how it's used with that same morphological background. It says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. They are not persecuted before they're just standing before God. They're persecuted for what they've done that's righteous. In uh, Matthew 21, 32, John came to you in the way of righteousness and you believed him not. Not only did John preach, not only did John condemn them, John also told them to access laid to the root of your tree. God getting ready to cut some of you all off. Look at it in Acts 13, I'm just going randomly. And when he says in Acts 13, it says, Oh, full of subtlety and mischief, thy child of the devil and enemy of all righteousness. If you want me to do this again and show you this, we can do it in discussion. There's a whole list of where righteousness is being used in the sense of the way it talks about grace reign through the righteousness, Christ taking the penalty, Christ being obedient to the Lord. And it also said it up here earlier, where it says through about the one man obedience. Let me make sure we get it. 19, so it don't look like I'm making it up. Boys, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. 
So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous, okay? So we're there. I did not pull up, oh, I'm gonna say my battery is low. Um, it's not plugged in. I'm glad I, uh, this time, this one gave me a warning. Let me see if it's plugged in. Okay, Garrett, take it and plug it in that one over there because that plug has a hole in it. You have to go quickly, I'm gonna shut down. It's right there behind. Touchdown. <sighs> I was scared because I got I didn't memorize all this. I memorize a lot of stuff, but I ain't that good. So it says, for as by many, it says for as by one man disobedience, that's unrighteousness. And it said, many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, many should be made righteous. And that's all I'm showing when it talks about grace reigns through righteousness, through Christ's obedience. What his obedience was doing is what is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 20. God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. So he says in verse chapter six, verse one, what shall we say then? We're talking about being saved, what it means to be saved. What, what, what does it mean? How do we understand if we're saved? Paul said, what should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Christ been killed. He was obedient. He died. He came for our righteousness. So what shall we say then? God did all of that. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He's making the point that if Christ died for you, He's going to tell you in a minute, you got to be in Christ. And if Christ died to sin, you should be dead to sin. You should be dead to that king. You should be dead to that sovereign. You should be lied to your new king and your new sovereign. Am I clear? Because I know I'm saying things that's not said all the time. But if it's okay, we can teach it five or six times if we need to. It says, God forbid. Most people say God allow you to do so. Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? More and more, you said the law was given that it might abound. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer than end? Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ, not baptized into water. You can, no man can baptize you into Jesus Christ. If he can't show him to me. No man can baptize you into the Holy Spirit. Christ has to baptize you into the Holy Spirit. And when you are baptized into Christ, the Spirit baptizes you into Christ. We can baptize you into water, which is a symbol. We cannot baptize. Look at what it says. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Baptizing somebody in water, they can go hold the same night. Whole whore, lie, steal, cheat, go up to the church and, and do whatever they do in the church and take your money. When this is the sovereign, you are now entering. When you, when you come into Christ and you say that you're going to follow him, you are being baptized. If you really mean it, you are being put into that covenant. You're not just being saved. As I can say, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, killed by power. You are in, in the covenant. You are delivered from death. It should be the fact that if somebody's going to kill you, that's all they're going to do is kill the body. That's what Christ was telling them about when he was telling them in Matthew chapter 10, 38, 10, 28, where he said, don't be a man that can kill the body. Because you and me, that's all he can do. Verse number four, therefore, this is important. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death. This is important that you understand this. We are buried with him by baptism into death. This is being saved that like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we should walk in newness of life. Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. But I'm going to show you something that is really, really sweet. Look at Romans. This is the whole letter, Romans 1.4. I want you to see something here. In Romans 1 and 4, let's read, let's read Romans. I'll just read down to 4. It's not going to take all day. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, prepare, I mean, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by the prophets in the Holy Scripture. Do you understand that? That's why I can tell you easily that what he's saying in Romans 10 
is going back to Deuteronomy. Because Paul is that you know what I'm what I'm getting ready to tell you. All this Bible was already talked about in the scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared, listen, to be the son of God with power, not Caesar is son of God. Christ is declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. I need you to understand something. By the resurrection of the dead, by the spirit, the spirit is involved in this. And it says, by whom we have seen, received grace and apostleship for what? To walk around and tell you I'm an apostle. You do what I say. I'm an apostle. You don't say nothing against me. He says, we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among I mean, among all nations for his name. He says, I have received this and been sent out for the obedience and for the obedience that I'm sent to. I, this is what he says in Matthew 28 and 18. Go into all the world and teach all nations. You command them to do all that I told you to do or to observe all things I told you. This is what apostleship is for. It's not for you to wear a big long coat and think people are going to jump down and, and scream and all this and give you a chicken dinner. Give you a big fat offering. Paul says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. How in the world are we going to lose all that when we get to the 10th chapter? I feel like one of the old writers in the Matthew, I troll not. And say, okay, so let's go back to where we were in chapter six, because we were having a good time in chapter six. We had already been baptized with him in baptism, and we had raised with him. And I wanted you to see that right there in verse five. For if we have been, go back to four, Tim. It says, we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like Christ was raised by the glory of the Father, the Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, he raised himself, the Father raised him as well. We should walk, this is key, in newness of life. Don't forget newness of life. For if we were planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. When are we going to, if you want to be saved, you need to be walking in resurrection power. That's what Christ was raised. He was declared the Son of God with power by resurrection of the dead. If you're buried with him in baptism, we should be walking in spirit power by resurrection of the dead. We should not be under the penalty of sin and death any longer. Yeah, I'm saved from my sin, but I, you know, I still sin a little bit. You know, I still, I still cuss a little bit. Well, you might cuss. It might not even be a sin. You might be telling the truth. Okay. Who told you that word was a cussing word? How many old people you know that'll pop off and they don't say feces or BM? You think they're going to hell because they say the other word? I don't. We know what it means. And some people, that's all they ever heard. I've been around children. That's all they ever heard, okay? They don't know all those nice words. My mama made us say BM. I found little, I found little white children. Sometimes they talk to say poop. But... The old people, they don't go out on nice work. They just get it out of their mouth and it's done. Okay, verse number six. Knowing this, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. The body of sin, the body that's under the penalty of sin and death, that we should henceforth not serve sin. For he that is, look, for he that is dead is freed from sin. You saved? You think you get saved from sin? It's way more than sin. It's a dominion. It reigns. He that is dead with Christ is freed from sin. That's how you know you are saved. You are in covenant with him. You are out of covenant with death. You're walking in newness of life. You're raised in newness of life. And it's way more than just saying a little confession. Now, verse 8 says, Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe also that we shall live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. Do you, if that's the case with him, do you not get excited that death has no more dominion over us? You can blow me up with a 44 Magnum. You can actually stab me and death will still have no more dominion over me because I'm free from death. That don't make somebody happy. I mean, we just come and serve for nothing. What you gonna do, precious love? What, what, what we gonna do? 
he says death has no more dominion over him for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. That's supposed to be our testimony. Verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. You want to say you saved? You got to be dead to something. Dead indeed to the reign of sin and death, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now listen to verse 12. Important is very important. Let not sin therefore reign. Let not sin therefore be king. Let not sin therefore rule. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. How in the world are you still thinking you sin, you saved and you still under the dominion of that old king? Didn't God tell them don't go back to Egypt? You think he was just saying that for them? It was written for our learning as well. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments. Now look at that word instrument. I looked that up last night and I said, I didn't know that. The word is hoplon. It's a weapon. I'm thinking, you know, like instruments that what you, I might be like you use a fork or spoon or a saw. No, it says neither yield ye your members as weapons of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as weapons of righteousness unto God. This is what we're looking at. It says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. If you yield yourself to the righteousness of God, you are saved. Sin will not have the dominion. You think because one time you sin, sin has dominion over you? Most of the time not. A lot of times God will correct you right then. A lot of times somebody else will correct you. Go, go and do the wrong thing. Somebody might hit you in the mouth and you receive instruction. Okay? Am I right? You know, because you might say some hard things to the wrong one. And they say, Lord, and then, Lord, I see you. You weren't with me on that one. I wasn't in the spirit. But it says, for sin will not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Notice, please get this, because this is what confused meant, and I meant to say confused meant, come in. For sin shall not have dominion, will not rule over you in death, for you are not under, look at this, the law. It doesn't say the law, it's under law. What law? Sin and death. It ain't talking about Torah. Context don't let you even go there. Sin can't have dominion. If it has dominion, you are under the law of sin and death. Keep reading, Tim. It said, but under grace, what then shall we sin? Because we're not under the law. That's what people take and say, you don't have to obey God. You're not under the law of sin, but under grace, God forbid. You're not under the law. You're going to do it anyway? That's stupid. Verse 16, know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whichever sovereign you're going to obey, you're his, you're his slave, whether of sin unto death, that we're going back to sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness, which we said about Christ, he said, but God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form that example of doctrine which was delivered. What example? Christ gave you an example who did no sin, neither was what? God found in his mouth. Being made free from sin. This is the person that's saved. Being made free from sin, you became service to righteousness. You didn't get to be free and get to chill. You know, you, you get saved, I'm going up beyond Going up beyond just to be with my Lord. You know that I was saying that song? No. You got a job to do. You were created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had foreordained that we should walk in them. And we think being saved is about us. It's not about us. It's about the warfare that we're in. There's two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And we are supposed to be using our instruments to fight against his kingdom. What's wrong with us? Why we keep listening to people preach and take our money and don't know the word of God? Verse 18, being made free from sin, he became servants unto righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh for ways you have yielded your servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity. In other words, you were wicked because you were in the flesh. 
Yield your members service to righteousness under holiness. He says, for well, when you were the service of sin, you were free from righteousness. You were damned. You were not saved from death. You were on the, you were on the plantation with all of the dead. You were the walking dead. Verse 21, what fruit had you in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Listen to 22, it's powerful. But now being made free from sin, again, being snatched out of that kingdom, but now being made free from sin, you become servants to God, right? And you have your fruit under holiness and the end everlasting life. Should I say salvation? That's what it's about. For the wages of sin is death. That's what Adam brought. But the gift of God is eternal life, not a gift like you just get a gift. No, this is Christ. This is his kingdom. This is his righteousness. And then you don't take, you think the gift of God is just you saved. And you don't take the gift of God as being him giving you a new king. You have the wrong attitude. And then he says, Know ye not, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. That's Romans 7 and 1. Notice, he said, don't you know that the law has dominion over man as long as he lives? Okay, he's going to make a point. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. That's Torah. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of the husband. Okay, Torah, you had a law that you were bound to your husband. If he's dead, you're no longer bound. He's dead. You're free. Now, what he, watch what he says in three. So if then, if while the husband lives, she be married to another, she be called an adulteress. Now she's wicked. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adultery, adulteress, though she be married to another man. Paul is not telling them that to remind them that he's getting ready to teach. And notice he also said that they knew this. So we're talking to people that would have known Torah, the covenant. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That is not saying that you are dead to Torah. All of chapter six says you are dead to sin. You are dead to sin and death. But because it says law, people say we, we not under the law. That's not what it's talking about. Wherefore, brethren, you will become dead to what law? The law that reigned from Adam to Moses, even those that did not, you're dead to that law by what? The gift, the body of Christ, that you should be married to another. Wait a minute. The illustration he gave is that the wife, when the husband dies, she's free from the law of that husband. But she go get married to another husband, she's under the law of that husband. Now we are free from the law of that ruler, death, sin unto death. You won't be, this is what being saved, being free from the law of sin and death and being married to Christ. So notice he says, you will become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead that we should bring forth fruit to God. That's where you begin to see we're under the law of Christ. He used the term married. He just said marriage got a law that's affixed to it. And then he goes back and says, but when you were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law of sin and death, did work in our members to bring forth fruit and fruit unto death. Yes, you had the law of sin and death. Yes, you had God's law being given, telling you what to do. But because you were under sin and death, you kept doing worse and worse. And it increased and increased so much so that you realized there's nothing you could do. But now, look at verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held. Can't be talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about the law of sin and death. But now, let me see how I look in ESV. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held as people because of Adam, we were held under that, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not oldness of letter. What do you mean oldness of letter? The law came so that sin might increase. It wasn't a law of sin and death. It was the law that God has that's going to amplify and show you your dirt and show you that you're under the law of sin and death. But because of the fact you still walking in that, you are going to be damned. 
But now if you're in Christ, you are free from that. But what about, what, what you mean, tell me nobody in the Old Testament will, will say? I said, you got to understand the whole of the scripture. There are people that saw Christ afar off. There was Christ speaking through the people, even back then. That's what some of the apostles say. Didn't they say the spirit of Christ was in them? And they did. Yeah, I know it did. It says, what shall, I, it says, what shall we say then? Or what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. All those sin was in the world. Some things you didn't know was sin. You ain't know some, but there's some you don't know until God revealed. You might not have known if you burn the grass in your yard and it set your neighbor on fire, you responsible that you've done an injustice to him and you got to go make restitution. I had not known sin but by the law. For I, let's say, for I had not known lust except the law said, thou shalt not covet. I didn't know. There's a lot of people that wouldn't have known that that was wrong, but God, but God's, I'm going to reveal it to you. Not that it wasn't already wrong, but I'm going to make you more culpable. But sin taken occasion by the commandment, notice we're talking about Torah now, wrought in, wrought in me all manner of craving or all manner of lust. Paul didn't say that I was out there adulterating, fornicating, killing, stabbing, and all. He says, lust, he's just letting you know, he's giving you one. He says, for without the law, sin was dead. Notice, sin take occasion by the commandment. Inside of me, it works that evil. And without the law, sin was dead. I, I, I wasn't, it wasn't like we, we going to do more and more and more and more. But now that we got a commandment, don't touch that. I've watched little children sometimes. You tell them not to touch stuff. And, they, and sometimes they'll start crying if they've ever got a spanking. <laughs> I've seen that. It says, for without the law, sin was dead. Now, he's going to explain. For I was alive, I was alive without the law once. How in the world? If sin and death, I was alive, I lived once without the law. I could do some things, but I was still under the death penalty. I was alive without the law once, but the commandment came, guess what? Sin revived and I died. I determined to be more rebellious by some kind of means, some kind of manner. But notice, and the commandment which was ordained to life, the commandment which was to make you humble, the commandment which was to get you to understand that you needed this God, that you needed the God that would bring you out of Egypt. You needed to do all of the things he gave in the covenant. He says that was ordained to life. I found it to be death. Why? Because the covenant was always going to be ratified in the son. And when he told Abraham through your seed, all of the nations would be blessed. He said, for sin taken occasion by the commandments deceived me and it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Why would God get rid of a holy commandment, a just commandment, and a good commandment? He says, was then that which good made death unto me? What? Let me read it over here in 13 on this side. Was then that which was good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, that you won't think you're good, so that others won't think that you're good, so that others won't think themselves not under the bondage of the king of death, that they won't think they're under the bondage. It says, sin worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin, it says, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. I'm going to show you, you're not just, I'm just not just a little bit bad. I'm just not, there just, just, ain't that much. Hey, God ought to get let me slide, you know, because I'm ignorant. I don't really know. Uh, I, I got ignorance going on. But look at 14, because he's going to explain, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am flesh. I am carnal, soul under sin. All humans were sold under sin. This is how the, this is how the flesh works. Adam brought sin on everybody that did not sin after the similitude. Unless you're buried with Christ in baptism, you are not saved. 
and it's got to be baptism in Christ. I'm not talking about water. It says, for that which I do, I allow not. This is what the carnal man does. He's talking about carnal. I allow not what that I would that do I not. I don't do what I want to do. What I would, that do I not. What I hate, that I do. In other words, I do the opposite of everything. If I'm supposed to do something, I don't. If I don't want to do something, I do it. And I'm finding something going on. He said, let me see what he's saying here. If I do that, which I would not, I consent that to the law that it is good. If I see that you gave a law and I still do wrong, I consent that the law is good. But there's a problem. There's a problem with in us, there's a problem that Adam gave us. What is the problem? Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent that the law is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And people take this scripture and they say, when I fornicate, when I adulterate, when I homosexuate, when I slander, it ain't me that's doing it. It's my flesh. It's sin that's dwelling in me to do it. Okay, we got a problem here. Is he talking about this and he's through talking or will he continue talking and explain what he means? I submit he's going to continue talking and he's going to explain what that means. Let's look and see. Verse number 18, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Well, let's see if that's the way he really feels, okay? Or was he talking to make a point? Because if he's only talking to make a point, we can't hold him to that, correct? I just, well, I just want to make sure. Let's see. I'm going to look at Colossians. Paul, the same writer. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, read 26. He's talking about what God has done, even the mystery. Do this, Tim. Since he said he was an apostle to the obedience of Christ, let's let him say he's a minister. 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you all, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which had been here from ages and generations, that is now made manifest to the saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ where? In you, where? In you, the hope of glory. Now, let's go back to where I was when he says, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. If that's the case, how can Christ be in you? Follow me. Because what will end up happening, you will have one scripture and you have no idea what the rest of the scriptures say. And all of a sudden, you're going to say, Christ say, I mean, Paul says, there's no good thing in my flesh. Let me go back to where it was. He says, for I know, verse 18, Nothing good dwells in me. Well, if Christ is in you and he's not good, that's a contradiction. Without Christ, there's no good thing. There's only one good. That's God. Without you being baptized with him, and without you being baptized and you have left the plantation of sin and death, and you come to the plantation of Christ's obedience and life, in you is no good thing. He says, well, I know that in, it's in me no good thing dwells that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but the ability to carry it out, for I do not the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sins that dwell in me. So I find it to be a law that I want to do right. Evil lies close at hand. I find that without Christ, he is talking about a life without Christ. I know people say, that ain't what it says, but he ain't through talking. Look at it. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God. It didn't say the law of sin and death. It, did, it said, I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law warring against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin and death that dwells in my members. Wretched man, I want to go, I, I, I know the way K, KJV said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I got a problem. I still got a war that's in my members right now. 
But that's why he said, don't yield your members as servants of sin and to sin. Don't you know if you yield your members to sin, you're going to be a servant. You're going to be back on the plantation. But yield your members to righteousness. But sin always wanted to come up. But I got the, I got the rule. That's what Cain was told. He said, Cain, if you do well, won't you be accepted? But if you don't sin, lie at the door. I don't know why when people take this and don't look at the whole body of Paul's writings and say this means that we're going to always be sinners. I'm getting ready to bust that. We'll be, we should almost be through. He said, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. I myself serve the law of God with my mind. This is what people say. I serve God with the mind, but I'm wicked. I'm going to bust that. I'm going to tear it up. But with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. That's when an individual is outside of God. Where do you get that from? Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If there's no condemnation, you cannot be under the law of sin and death. He's already explained that Adam brought death and he brought condemnation for his disobedience. So therefore, if you're in Christ, you're not under the law of sin and death. You are saved from the law of sin and death. Prove your point, Tim, I will. For the law of the spirit of life has set me free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I don't have to obey it. I don't have to walk around weak. I don't have to walk around like a limp dish rag when I'm supposedly trying to, yes, I don't have to walk around like a limp dish rag when I'm trying to clean my gutters. It ain't gonna work. It says for what God has done, look, for what God has, for what, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, the same man that say I do such and such and such and such and such, the way they explain it, they make it like this man is not walking righteousness. Let's go back to read it for those of us that are used to the authorized version. But what, I'm in mean, verse three, Romans eight, what the law could not do and it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. You don't have to live that way. I condemn sin in the flesh. I have showed, I have brought you relief. I have come to offer you the opportunity to live with me, to rule with me, to be under my suzerain, to be under my government. And therefore he says that the righteousness of the law come into my government, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It's a qualifier. When you walk after the spirit, that raised him from the dead. When you walk after the one that God gave us as a free gift, you are no longer under the law of sin and death. That's what you're saved from. Do you walk after the spirit? Or are you still walking in sin? Are you still the same evil person? Are you still the same lustful dog? Are you still masturbating? Are you still fornicating? Are you still lying on people? Are you still getting up in church singing and going home and raising living hell? Are you still a covetous person? Are you still swearing on different politicians you know that are wicked because they're on the party I like with no discernment? Verse five, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's what he was saying, verse chapter seven. But they after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Paul says, for to be carnally minded is death. If you're going to say that Paul is saying this is how he lives, then Paul is saying I'm dead. You say, I know that in my flesh, well, no good thing. Take his context. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Here you go. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7, for the carnal mind is an enemy against God. It is not subject to the law of God. It says, neither indeed can be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's the problem. That's the problem. The carnal mind will never allow itself to be subject to the righteous law of God. Now, what I got to do is show you one last thing. The last thing 
that I want to show you is in Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah with me, 31 and 31. I want you, I want you all to see the power of what God is doing with these people. Jeremiah says through the Lord, behold, the days come, saith Yahweh. I will make a new covenant. I will make a new covenant. I made a covenant before when they brought you out of Egypt. I'm going to, you gave yourself and made covenant with somebody else. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. My covenant, they break. I'm not going to make an animal covenant with them this time. I'm not going to make a covenant with a building with them anymore. Although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. Please look at this very, very carefully. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord. Make the print bigger, Tim, because you're getting ready to make a point. All right. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law in their inward parts. Click on law, Tim. What does it say? I will put my Torah in their hearts. If you're going to say that you're saved, you're free from the law of sin and death, then you got another king ruling in your life as a suzerain. You are under the covenant with him. What is the covenant? Remember I said he lets you know who he is. He lets you know his rules. He lets you know his regulations. He gives you his history and then he gives you sanctions. After he gives you sanctions, he gives you his blessings, his curses. He has witnesses. Guess what? I'm going to bring you a king. He's going to reign in righteousness and adjustment, justice. He's going to be a wonderful counselor. He's going to be mighty God. I'm sending him to you. He's going to be your suzerain. He's going to be everything that they say Augustus is and more. He's going to bring about peace. But you're going to have to do what he says. He's going to give you laws. So I'm going to write those laws on your heart. But he's going to have sanctions. If you don't think he has sanctions, why did Paul tell you? No, you're not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor abusers themselves with mankind, nor effeminate shall inherit the kingdom of God. Why do you think he's saying Galatians? That the works of the flesh are manifest with the deeds, and he gives a list. I've told you before in time past that it through these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why do you think in Revelation 21 and 8 it says, The fear for the unbelieving, the murderers, the abominable, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death? Those are sanctions. But he gives you other sanctions, sanctions of reward. That you can walk with me with new robes. That you can rule and reign with me. That you will inherit the earth. That you will be made life. It is the same kind of covenant that has always been in the world. So he said, I'm going to put my law in their inward parts and right in their hearts. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. I'm going to be the suzerain. I'm going to be the overlord. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor saying, know the Lord. Look, for they all shall know me. I've already covered that about last week or two weeks ago, knowing God's eternal life. John 17 and 3 says, this is life eternal, that they know thee the only Christ, God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life. Now, he says in Jeremiah, he's going to write his law in their heart, and it was Torah. Again, let's see, did he do it? Hebrews 8 and 8. In Hebrews 8 and 8. It says, God finding fault with Israel, his people with them, saying, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I just read it in Jeremiah. He's quoting that. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. I'm not going to kill an animal. I'm not going to sprinkle blood all over the table. I'm not going to sprinkle the blood with his up on the people. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shed my blood. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be worse if they go against me. He says, I led them out of Egypt because they continue not in my covenant. I regarded them not, saith the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after this day, saith the Lord. I will put my laws. I showed you in Jeremiah was Torah. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and look. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor 
and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they all shall know me. We don't value knowing God. We don't value knowing God is eternal life. When you know him, you know him as king. You know him as sovereign. You're free from sin and death. When you say you're saved, you're saved from the bondage of sin. You're saved from the reign of sin. You're saved from the dominion of sin. You're saved from death. You have now become alive under Christ. And if you're not alive under Christ, you're still alive under sin and death and you're dead to Christ. You either gonna be dead to Christ or you're gonna be dead to sin and death. And you're talking about I'm saved because I said a sinner's prayer. You think it's that easy, you crazy. But what about the old people that didn't know? God, God know how much they had the capacity to know and what they had opportunity to learn, but he also know what we, we neglect. I try to make sure you don't have no reason to go against God. I try to make sure that you can learn everything that I know and go past that. And if you don't do at least a little bit that I teach you, you can be damned. I want you damned if you do this to our king. The only one that cared about us over here being whipped and beaten and robbed and pillaged. And my daddy out there in Carnival, Georgia, they call that a sharecropper, which is another form of slavery. And those people still own all that land out there and none of that, all that labor, we got nothing to show for it. You think that I think that God had no hand in it? He did have a hand in it because something our ancestors did and God let his hand be on us and many other people in Africa. We need to turn back to God so that God's blessing will be on us and nobody will be able to enslave us again. Do you hear me? Yes, you do. Hebrews 10 and 16 says, this is the covenant. He says it again. I just want you to see in the 15th verse, it just says, well, the Holy Ghost is also witness to us. But after this that he said before, the Holy Spirit is tied into this. I want you to understand something. For those of you that don't believe that it's a covenant, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to tell you. When you get to the book of the Revelation, you're going to see this same pattern. They're going to say, I am Alpha and Omega. This is what Jesus is going to say. He's going to say, I'm the first and the last. He's going to tell you, I'm the one that is living, that was dead, and I'm alive forevermore. And then you know who he is. He's going to let you know he's the prince of the kings of the earth and have made us a kingdom of priests, history. He's not only going to show, show you the history and show you what he's done, he's going to allow you to understand throughout the book of the Revelation, I don't take idolatry. He's going to give you sanctions. If you look at those churches, you do this, you do this, you, you left your first love, you better return. You got that Jezebel in there, you better get that girl out of there. You following the teachers of the Nicolaitans, you better get them out of there. You got to follow the teachers of Balaam, you better get them out of there. Same kind of sanctions, blessings and curses are in the book of the Revelation. Then you got witnesses. He got, especially got two that don't come up and talk. He got two witnesses. Then when you go from there, he shows you what the witness is going to do and you maintain peace and he's your protector, he's your provider. The Bible is covenantal. It's not just a mental ascent that I made a prayer. That's why you got so much people in living in hell in the church. They don't understand it's a covenant. It's a king. That's why people think they're supposed to come to God, get saved, and go to church, sing, beat the drum, play the piano, and sing. And that's it. And don't know we're supposed to rule. Our white brothers, yes, I said white brothers. I didn't say anything derogatory. I, I mean, I'm, and I'm speaking of those that know the truth. They know we're supposed to reign. And those that did not believe in God but knew what the Bible said, they reigned. They set up a constitution. They set up a bill of rights and excluded Jew. They set up a constitution, a bill of rights, made charters, made laws, made a police force, made a government, had a military, and they determined where you could live, what the taxes would be. They did everything that God does. And here we are, the people of God, and we don't think we're supposed to rule. How in the world are you going to be the light of the earth if you don't show people what needs to be done? How are you going to be the salt of the earth if you have no preserving power? How are you going to rule and reign with him? He said the harvest is plentiful. Pray that he would send somebody in the harvest. Send them out in the harvest. No, we want to go to church only. He said, I will make you fishes of men. We think that means to get people saved. He, why he didn't tell the apostles, go and get people saved. 
He told them to go and you teach them to observe all that I command you. You think when he gave his covenant and he gave his laws on the mountain, you think that was just a nice little thing? Do you all remember Matthew chapter five and seeing the multitude, he went up into the mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are they that hunger and thirst, blessed are you persecuted for righteousness sake. And when he started telling them all these things, then he told them, let's share righteousness, see the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, five and 20 Matthew, told them how to pray in the sixth chapter of Matthew, chapter seven, told them to judge and beware of false prophets. You don't understand. He was setting up kingdom order and somebody told us to do church. No doubt, based on how gracious God is, there'll be some people that'll get to be, that'll be saved and they might get to go to heaven despite. But there are going to be some that they're going to reject these words and they're going to determine Sir, I know you, uh, you're a hard man and I took my talent and I buried it. Remember the parable, parable of the talents? One man had one, one had two, one had five, the one had five doubled, the one that had two doubled as before and the one that had one buried it. And he was called wicked for burying his talent. He wasn't called wicked because he went out and had sex with somebody or killed somebody or stabbed somebody or blasphemed or prayed to another God. He was called wicked because he did not do what he's supposed to. Remember the parable of the 10 virgins? Five of them weren't ready. They weren't prepared. Are we prepared? I'm going to say this and then I'm going to stop. The saddest thing, one of the saddest things that we present to our king, and I didn't say this earlier, but all, all kings, all sovereigns demand tribute. I forgot to say that. One of the saddest things that I would have to say is this. When it comes to our God, we don't give him the respect to do his name. We don't help him expand his kingdom. We think expanding his kingdom is get some more people to come and sit down. We don't go about doing good like he did. They may never say about us that we turn the world upside down. That was a wicked saying that because you can turn everything right. So they say you turn everything upside down. We don't see kingdom. We see church. And we'll live and die. And all we'll know is sister this, brother this, reverend this, elder this, so and so and so. But in the marketplace, we're joke. It's sad that Muslims not a joke when they go out. I said, you hear what I said? When the Muslims go out, they're not a joke. They'll go in. They'll set up their Sharia law. They'll do what they need to do. They'll look out for one another unless they're in a different tribe of Muslims or a different sect. They'll set up their own law and they'll go and take over a city. They'll take over a nation. Look at the Mormons. The Mormons do what we don't do. The Mormons have so much out there in Utah, they took over. All this time, you had this so-called Christianity in America. All, but let's just look at we black people. We the ones that are still got laws against us on the book right now. That if you're arrested and you're convicted of a crime, you can be made a slave. 13th Amendment has never been rescinded. Well, that can make the same thing for what? But who is it used against? When you go look at your records, who is it used against? The Mormons sit up there and look at us. What do we have? What have we done? We still begging for a job. We still begging you to give us your reverendship. We still begging, let us in your Bible college so you can give us credentials because people in our neighborhood, they won't respect us unless you give us a credential. Give us another psalm book. Tell us who we are. Tell us that we were savages in Africa. Tell us we were nothing. Tell us we were savages in Africa. And if you all hadn't given us Christianity, we would be over there still naked. Tell some more goddamnable stinking lies. Tell them. Tell them. Tell them that. Won't you tell them that you brought over here the smart people? 
Why don't you tell them you brought the people over here that had trades and skill sets? Why don't you tell them that there were kingdoms that they had that you have written in your book, you have pictures of, but you don't show that? Why don't you tell them that the people came over here and their name was Yah, Obadiah, Ben Yah, and all of those names? Why don't you tell them you didn't teach them the songs proven by Yah? Why don't you tell them that the Bible was written not over there in Europe or the Caucasus Mountains or over there in Ukraine? Why don't you tell them that the Bible was written over there in areas where we talking about that you call Africa now? Because Abraham left Arabia and went over there, didn't he? Did Abraham leave Ur the county? Yes, he did. But why don't you tell him that? Why don't you tell him that the, that the real Hebrew, why don't you tell him that the Israelites were always marrying Canaanites? You don't tell me that they were, I saw him marrying Alexander the Great people. Alexander the Great didn't exist then. Because you don't want us to serve our God. And we won't serve him because we want to be saved. We want to be saved. And that saved is like a badge. You would put on your little daggum Sunday coat, put on your little dog collar around your neck like the Catholic Church, and you stand up on the pulpit. <laughs> or the preacher stand up, and then you stand up. And everything is bishop this, pastor this, bishop this. And the Most High God can't get nothing out of your life when it comes to you and your family. His children can't get any. Can't get any on your job. You're ashamed of it and you act like he's not a king. But let me tell you something. If you could picture, if you could picture, I, I could take Luke Cage, but most people don't know about Luke Cage, but I'll take like cartoon Superman or, or like the Hulk, something that, like that you could see. And, and that person was behind you when you said something, you tell somebody to stop or you tell somebody who, who you were and you know he's standing right there real tall because he was real tall, I, you wouldn't be ashamed. And that's a fictional character. We act like we don't have God. We are ashamed of the gospel. You believe Jesus is God? No, no, I believe he's the son of God. You don't? And you worship him and he's, as a man, you got a problem. We're not ruling you all. We're not leaving a legacy for our children. If all we're gonna do is come in and talk about the Bible, this is our blueprint to rule. Even in that movie Denzel Washington was in, it was called The Book of Eli. That man wanted that book because he knew that that book would give a blueprint how to rule. And I'm gonna say this and I'm finished. We'll go to discussion. If we don't sit down and think, what would it be like if God gave us the power tomorrow? We black people that say we've been oppressed. And it's not just saying it's true. He gave us the power to rule America tomorrow. What would we do when people steal? What would be the penalty? What would be the penalty when somebody go out there and shoot their girlfriend and kill them? What would be the penalty when they abort somebody and kill an innocent baby? What would be the penalty when somebody go and they blaspheme God's name? What would be the penalty when somebody drunk driving and kill somebody? What would be the penalty when somebody just start shooting missiles into our air? In other words, have you ever thought about what it means to rule? Because if you haven't, you will always be ruled. We don't think in terms of how it is to rule. We don't even want to rule our community, let alone our home. You think God brought us here to be chumps? When Israel went to Egypt, they needed food. Guess what? They end up being over Egypt. Somebody say, I didn't see that in the Bible. Did you see who got blessed? Who did, did Jacob get blessed or did Pharaoh get blessed? Who called who the son? A pharaoh is like a son to me, okay? We don't think in terms of ruling. What an insult to God. Every prince should be thinking about ruling. Every priest should think about being in charge. But what we do is, well, you know, the Pope said that we supposed to worship on Sunday. They said that in the 1700s. Uh, well, the Pope said that all of you all, let's come back to Rome. Uh, the Pope said this is Ash Wednesday. Let's put the ashes on our head. You see your king? Show me one Pope that ever cared for us. You don't think in terms of ruling, you won't. And it's not easy. That's why Solomon prayed, Lord, you've made me king over these people. I don't know how to go in and out. 
That's one prayer that we ought to be praying, Lord. I don't know how to rule, but should you ever put me in the position to rule over a business, over a community center, over something, please teach me how to rule with justice and equity. Because if you say that you're going to do the same thing, lock the person up in jail, and that's not what God said, all you're doing is taking one legal system that's unjust and that's wicked and replacing it with a black face. Somebody will leave the face white. We already got enough sin on us, let alone ruling and doing more. Are you saved? What does it mean to be saved? Delivered from the dominion of that king, the king of death, sin and death. How do you know that you're saved? That you yield yourselves to members of righteousness by the spirit of God and that you no longer allow sin to reign in your body and that you are subject to the law of God. Tim, it's way more to it than that. It is that you, you don't have 50,000 hours, but I believe I gave enough synopsis that we will be talking about more and more suzerain treaties, covenants. Because we don't act like we under covenant. We think a covenant is just somebody cut something and died. It's deeper than that. Father of heaven, thank you for your blessed word, your righteousness, and your rule in your kingdom. Help us to realize this is serious business. The way we've done church has not really benefited us that much. We learned some songs. We learned to put on a big old hat, Lord, and Sometimes people can't even see the preacher because the hat's so big. We learn to dress a funny way. We learn religious talk. But we don't know how to rule. We don't know how to rule. We're your sons and your daughters. We don't even know how to rule in our own home, rule ourselves. We still doing stuff. Chasing us where we need it. Beat us where we need it. Scourge us where we need it. So that we can be conformed to the image of your son. I ask these things because it's necessary. In the blessed name of your holy child, Jesus the Christ, amen. Amen and amen. I now open our class for discussion, if there's any discussion to be had today. And if there's not, that's okay. Why y'all smile? <laughs> okay, then if nobody got anything to say, well, at least each person give me three minutes. Three. Three minutes. Uh, three minutes coming. We have nothing to say. Bring up three minutes for beginning. I like you too. how you continue to talk about the laws that are mentioned in Romans because I think that, um, let's say, depending on if someone has or hasn't, has, or if or haven't, hasn't read, um, they might get confused or forget that it is still talking about the law of sin and death. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you keep, you kept mentioning it because the context does matter. And so I, I, I really like how you kept doing that. And so to divorce, um, the context, sixth chapter, fifth chapter, eighth chapter, it is, it is very problematic and, and to reduce it down. I, I like, I don't know if, if, if a lot of people even understand what you were doing. You said, okay, we got all of this body, what we call the Old Testament. We got the law, we got the prophets. We have what we call the New Testament. And you take one verse and all of a sudden you're saved, I mean, then you gotta do you have to do some serious acrobatics, ac acrobatics. Yeah. Acrobatic and yeah, twisting, mm -hmm. lifting from context to say that you say, and then to say, okay, you said, well, you say from death. Well, we, I know another time you had taught it, this might have been two or three years ago, say from God's wrath. We go to that second chapter of Romans and we start around the uh, the third and fifth verse, getting down to the sixth verse, he's like, God, God, he's long suffering, you know, um, that uh, I, I can't remember, it's like that men will, it's, I make, it makes me think of Peter, but you deny, 
You would despise the you goodness of God's two? Two, Romans two. Okay, let me despise the goodness of God's judgment, which is to lead you to I can't remember he says God repentance. Was, repentance. Mm -hmm. repentance. And then it says because his wrath is coming. There you go. Mm -hmm. So this and then like because if, if I let my son come, you 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 quoted or alluded to first Corinthians five to one, he's made sin. I, I like I did this for you, you know. That's the I, gift. I, I let I let him come. He died. He 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 endured. I mean, he was crying. He was crying for real. You know, like take this. I mean, I know what I got to do, but it, is there another way? No. And then you just gonna treat that any kind of way, you know? And we do see pictures of that. We see pictures of that. Um, when it's coming up out of Egypt. You know, but he's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow you up. I'm gonna kill, I'm gonna kill a lot of y'all. So, save from sin and death. But there's, there's a wrath of God that's gonna come. I mean, you mentioned Revelation a lot. I mean, it's in Revelation. It's, it's all in there. So, um, there, there is a responsibility. You went to, uh, I don't know if you read it, but Colossians one. I'm not in my sort of twenty four. When so we got to fill up the measure. Yeah, I skipped that verse. That I started to go back and get it, but let's see how, see how good you are. We got to fill up the measure of that which was left behind, and he does mention suffering. That's where that maturity come in, and I know, I'm like, okay, because we be looking at the hurt, the pain, and what they're going to say, but it's like, well, <laughs> you'll be all right. <laughs> if you have him, you You'd be better than all right. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we what we think is death. I mean, it's not. It, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not. Um, I don't remember because I've listened to a lot of all season truth messages um, within about the last week and a half. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I I just go back and I'm I'm listening. I just choose some. So it's sometimes I think I've heard you say something quite recently, but it might be ten, fifteen years ago. <laughs> but uh, it's like. No, um, there, there's a responsibility, and uh, and it, it's 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 kind of sad that we didn't we didn't get this, but um, we we getting it now. And I know the scripture talk about redeeming the time to show a man that um, he's going to be fired, and he he, he does some he got some wicked conniving going on, but Christ don't con he doesn't he doesn't commend them. The wickedness, he commends the shrewdness. He said, yes, right. the wicked can be shrewd. What, what about what about the the way you 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 ought to be shrewd and wise in wisdom, righteousness? He said he redeemed the time. So I don't, don't want to ramble, but I, I really like how he put in both laws there. Because it's always it's 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 this doctrine and it's this doctrine. See, we're, and we'll parse both of them. We'll parse so-called Christianity or the doctrine of righteousness, and we'll have so much evil and wickedness. Like a leaven, you put leaven in there and it's messing it up. But you take the you take the wicked, and okay, so you got confusion, you got Buddhism, you got Baha'i, you got, you got New Ageism, you, 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 you got, everybody want to say them all. I'm like, you got patriots, you got, you got, you got patriots, you got black, you got Chinese, yeah. you, every culture just about is a religion too because they have their do's and don'ts. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll just destroy ourselves. I, I can't stand, you know, I, I mean, I'm in it. I'm in it like different times of the day. Mm -hmm. People feel like because they say something, they see something that it's the law that everybody's supposed to bow down to, whether it's, uh, it's crazy. It is crazy because if, so you start them out little, you know. Um, you can be this, you can do that, you, you know. You, what your hopes and your dreams, and then you get into the church and your hopes and your dreams. Are, and I'm like, was it just a song? <laughs> the song that we were listening to. I was like, oh no, he didn't choose you because you was money. Mm -mm. So uh, the the law of Right, the spirit of Paul said you you went to Galatians. I think you alluded to Galatians two and twenty. Some crucified, but it, it talks about that law. Nevertheless, I'm, he says I'm dead, but it's the law because Christ is in you. So Colossians one and twenty seven, the hope of glory in you. Co co 
Paul saying in Galatians, I'm showing it's winning. It's not me, it's Christ that lives in me in the, in the life that I now live. Though I'm though the sinful man, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Oh man, is dead, but we must, we must be reminded. I got to be reminded. She helped remind me a lot of times. Oh, do you, do this, does, it, do does it make you hate her? Huh? Does it make you no. hate her? No, I would be. I would be. I would be. That was supposed. That was supposed to be fun. I just kept a straight face. She laughed. I'm like, you know, David ran. David ran to correct. He ran to. He avoided it. He avoided it for. I think it was close to a year. He avoided it, but then he ran to it. I'm gonna write the life. You know. Because he said, well, I can, I can grow after this. I mean, he still has some issues, but uh, you see, he wasn't lost. He, 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 his understanding, his understanding was greater. Um, you always see in the scripture when you're dealing with the king, they was like David, they wasn't like David, or they was like Jeroboam, the one that caused Israel to sin. It's like, Ooh. look at how you, it's Ooh. such a contrast right there. Um, I'll stop. That's, that's, that's longer than long. That's, that's okay. When no, no, nobody else chimed in. And I, you know, I can't control people's mouths. I'll say this too. The okay. message is helping me, helping me grow. Uh, oh, thank the Lord. Uh, that time when I guess, you know, I won't say it don't look like it because you don't always get to see what stuff look like. You have to, mm -hmm. it's like, I won't say incubation. Incubation, like, well, let's say, Okay, like let's let's take your side for a while. Like your side was going to like half an inch or, or a centimeter every two or three weeks. For a long I time. think that he was. I was like, what in the world? It's like I, I saw you. <laughs> and so sometimes it's slower than that. But so long that we that we grow in the messages, I'm gonna say even when we were over there, um, they 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 really been helping me, and I I thank God for godly counsel. And if we if we don't understand that. If we don't begin, if we haven't to see that the lesson is there's counsel in that. What if we're gonna get our counsel from if it's not from the word? Mm -hmm. The counsel. So um it's it's been it's been good for me because I'm like, we better have it because let's say the one to seminate passes away. You know, then what? God ain't dead. Mm -mm. He ain't dead. And I'm sure they're gonna bite the dust. Yeah. So um, it got to be like the disciples. I, the, the Christ was gone. He said, and they remember what he had said, and they remember what he had said. So that that seed, the seed, come up. They come up to the light. Watch if you YouTube. They showed us on the those old movie Bible Institute, the doc, that instructional thing. I think one of them, maybe one of them, but you put the seed in the ground and it always, it always turns up because you got your light, the, the light source is upward, it's not downward. They may start on that, but they may turn up. You watch a plant, you watch a plant, you can, you can, you can water it, it needs that water, it almost, sometimes it up, you can almost see it, but that next day, it, there's a difference unless the root's dead. If the root's dead, you got a problem. The root ain't dead. So, so if the roots are alive, what happens? If the root alive, it's gonna burn. And then what happens? It's gonna, it's gonna go up. So you I mean if you have a root of bitterness? That's another yeah. kind of life. So you got the life of sin. That's why I was asking that. I was thinking about life. I think about that root of bitterness well, that he said you're bitter. One well, is gonna lead to, to, to death. Yeah. But when you can when when Adam lived, he was dead. You know what Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. So people walk around because they can do stuff, feeling all great and stuff. It's like you, you, you can sing you in the know, church. That, that has man, replaced your righteousness. Who did he tell your money buried? Didn't Jesus tell that? No, that uh, Peter, Peter, Peter told Peter. that to Simon Peter Maggie. Said, yeah, your money buried with the crew. You thought you could buy the Son. gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Please. I left out the I left off the first part. Please. If you had been you had been baptized in water. Yes. Yes. Roy, did you have did you did you did you have anything you'd like to say? I'm sponging up. 
By the way, I like your beard. Andrew, do you have a song? When you were going through the world, and you know how you read something, you read it, you read it, and yes, yes, I got it. And there has always been some sort of division in my mind when I hear Romans 6, 7, and 8. I, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I guess I've just been conditioned because of chapters, you know, in church. And, but when you read it, I, said, I could see that what he did in chapter six, he started off with an argument and he's explaining what it looked like in chapter seven. When you understood the, the law of sin and death, those things, those things in your flesh, you want to do right, you, want, you can't do it. He's telling you when when sin and death reigns in you, this is what it looks like. Then he goes back and tells you, now when Christ reigns in you, this is what it looks like. He's explaining that to the seventh and the eighth chapter. He's saying, this is how, this is when you switch reign. This is what this reign looks like. When the reign when when death reigns in you, the law of sin and death. You got these things in your flesh. You can't do things that are right. He's not really talking about anything personally. He's saying, this is what we inherited in our flesh. And this is what it looks like. He just told you, don't let it rain in you. Don't let that sin and death rain in your body that you obey it. Now he's explaining to you, this is what it is. This is what this rain looks like, except. And the stuff you want, you want to do right, but you can't, and you find that it's something in your flesh. That's that thing reigning. That's death and sin and death reigning in your body. Then he said, now but you switch, you change husband. This is what Christ reigning in you looks like. And when you walk, not after the flesh, but after the spirit, he's explaining what he just said in chapter six. And I look and it's like, it just dawned on me that that's what he was <laughs> doing. <know>. <laughs> and it's, it, because I guess they always separated so much, but when you read through it, it's just like, it's like that. so that's what he's doing. I wish I'd have read on to the 13th verse where he tells these people that are living, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But I, I might deal with it. I might deal with it too. I, I, I might take it. I don't know. I may take it to chapter 10 and show that he was never through with Israel. I don't know. Because I because because I do want to finish Job, but I do need it to be shown that even in the days of Job, though there was a group of people they felt they were righteous. And they wouldn't they were not what Job was. You don't have to always look righteous to be righteous. And I also thought about Luke, Luke 19. Mm. Where he's talking with the New Testament, he said when Zacchaeus is too. I believe so, because I'm getting ready to share the screen. And Zach, he told Zach, Zachary's salvation can come to your house because you're also a son of Abraham. But look at what he calls salvation. Zach has changed. Okay, he said, this is what Christ, when Christ comes and he dwells in you, something's supposed to happen to you. You're supposed to change. He said, listen, I'm half of my goods I give. I will give it to you. Restitution. Restitution. And, and if I stole it from someone, I'm going to restore it. So this is, he said, you're going to reign. You're the new king. Under the new rule, under the old rule, I was stealing from people. I wasn't giving nobody nothing. I wasn't doing any of that. But under the new reign, when, when you reign, things change. I have to be different, and I know I have to be different. And Messiah called it salvation. And then he goes on to explain it even further and say, yeah, some of y'all ain't going to want me to rule over you. And he talks about it, say a nobleman went to a certain country to receive for himself the kingdom. The kingdom. Mm -hmm. And he gave those, you mentioned this, he gave those ten talents, or those that what they call the millers or something, and, and Luke. He gave them to ten of his servants. He gave ten of his servants. I think it's ten servants. And the one came back and had 10. And it, but then it says that there were some people in the, the citizens. Say, we the citizens hated him. They hated him. They hated him. They hated him. They hated him. And, and sent a message after him saying, we will not 
have this man to rule over us. And I like the way they said it with because they didn't put man in there, okay? Man is in the talent. So we will not have this to reign over us. We don't want it. Mm -mm. And that's and that's the that's what you were talking about when people go around and say that, oh, you know, I was saved from sin so I can keep sinning. And obviously that's been what people thought for a long time because Paul had to explain that you can't do that. If it's I can, not what this means. If I can know? get somebody to make like a little <laughs> Superman cape or turn around like it's a bib, they used to call it a was it called a dicky where you could take yeah. it and have a little collar? If I could yeah. just make one that you could put like a chain like this and it just has like a little scarf on it, and I tell people if you wear this, you'll be saved and you can do anything you want to. And if they believe it, you probably would never have to see me go to work again as long as I live. They would pay. Huh? <laughs> see, I said I would have to work. Because that's what they do in the Catholic Church, they sell the scapula. A scapula is that little brown cloth. You see it on the web. And they say, if you're wearing this when you die, you automatically go to heaven. All your sins are forgiven. So yes, when you said that, that's what it made me think of. It says, we, we, we make saved, being saved, something mental, something up in heaven. But I thought the meat would inherit the earth. You make it where he got to kill everybody off and do the rapture. That he ain't ever gonna obey him while I'm alive. It can't take too much. He can't get nothing. It's almost like raping somebody, you know. You know, like they say some undertakers do that. I'm not trying to besmirch, I'm just telling the truth. And you know, like he, sometimes you try to talk to a woman or you see somebody try to talk to somebody and they think they're cute and say, I would never give you the time of day. And he keeps talking say, over my dead body. Yes, yeah, the only way you'd have me over my dead body. That's the way we do God. I'll never obey you. I have to be dead first. So, guess what? I die, and you take me to heaven, then I'll obey you. I ain't gonna do it while I'm alive. But if, if I die, I, you can have me after I die. But while I'm alive, I ain't got nothing for you, man. <laughs> yeah, that's just funny. We've seen it from the beginning, dog. I mean, even what, what's what's the move from Adam? Moses trying to save them, and he he delivers them from was it uh he he he, he kills this Egyptian, right? Right. And then he stops a division between the Hebrew people, right? And they get mad. At they get mad at they get mad at who you're supposed to be. We're, we're telling them. Yeah. So, you out. Was there anybody on the conference line too? And then, you know, God delivered them. And Moses, Moses is in the mountain getting, let's say, the law. Mm -hmm. And then they start lying. We had it better in Egypt. They might have had it better in Egypt in their mind. Because sometimes the Lord take you through stuff. But if the problem is that's what only what you see. But they said we had we 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 had like leeks and uh, what was that they said? Leeks and onions and they, they might not have had to eat the pig gut. Hey, give me the manana. <laughs> <laughs> what was that worship children in mind? You know, like yeah, that, no, see, yeah, but you think it, but you all you mean. see what's <laughs> going on, you think Moses leave you the worst the worst. And you're going to die here in the wilderness. At least we would have had a slow death in Egypt. <laughs> yeah, you didn't, like <laughs> you didn't have to put blood on the door post or anything. And I see you got your fingers, oh, got some things open too, Pat. Yeah. When you was talking about Romans 7, mm -hmm. 6, 7, and 8, it made me think of a bird. I'm like, if you put a bird in a cage a lot of the time, here long enough, you can open the door and they won't go out. Mm -hmm. Or if you feed, if you feed a wild, I want to say an animal that's wild, sometimes the, I think the mother will abandon them. I, I don't know if they smell the human touch on them or whatever, but it's like it, it does it does something. So like that 
they won't sometimes go out and eat or whatever. So it's just like that condition of hearing. You say, you say, I have heard some people preach when you were coming and doing the campus crusade. I, I got to where I was like, I can't, I didn't go all the time. I'm like, I, you know, God, I would, when I would say something, they looked at me like I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. you know, I used to tell Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, I, 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 you know, I say something. And I'm looking serious because I'm like, oh, y'all talking crazy. Uh -huh. and, <laughs> it just doesn't seem like I didn't care. Like, right. But um, they would stay after class and miss yeah. the next class. Yeah. Um, it's like that bird. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving you freedom, but it's like the door is open and it's like, no, this is good. It's in my house. I, I, you got trees out there. <laughs> like, bird, it ain't going. So I. Like, the mind, you know, if you look at if you look at Roman eight, it's doing a lot with the mind. It's the what's your your heart and your mind. The mind is not subject. What is it? It is the, the law of God. Mind means. is enmity. Yes, God. Of God, and it's not subject. What do you mean? I'm married to you now. I forget that. Um, you know, um, but can't can't see the blessing. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's a nice one. So, what'd you see, oh, Patrick? Really it it did. It did. It did. <laughs> oh, what, what you, you got one, two, three, four, five. You got five oh, spaces open. What you trying to do, Patrick? Because <laughs> I, I said I got to get Patrick before we close. <laughs> Go ahead. Somebody say something, too? Yeah, yeah. Somebody said something. Yeah, somebody said something. Yeah, somebody said something. Yeah, somebody said something. Hey, Brother Charles, while you didn't say anything, you can argue with me. You can argue with me the other day. Give me some. I'll try to get it before he run away. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Brother Patrick. He can argue with me tonight. But um, that's interesting that you brought up. Cam brought up Romans 6, 7, and 8. Because lately I've been thinking of it like that too. Like I read and be like, man, let me go back. If I'm, you remember reading eight, some be like, let me go back to uh, six. Sometimes maybe five. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, all right, let me run it in there. And I'll be like, let me keep reading. Why did she say this in nine right after me? And then keep going, let me keep reading. You know, that's all going. So I'm starting to look at it like sometimes even reading. Cause a lot of times I used to, I would look at like chapter 18. I just read, I'm reading through it. I say it like the narrator would do, chapter 19. <laughs> and then sometimes now I just get to it and I just keep reading now and say the chapter. Mm -hmm. Almost like the number one there. I'm like, and then you begin to see, oh, that next one look like that. Like your Matthew 24 and 25, or your Matthew 22 yeah. and 23, really 22 all the way to about 25 or so. You start to see, oh, it's the whole thing. The Matthew five all the way to seven. Oh, he was saying all oh, this. I'm like, oh, you gotta, you gotta get all that. <laughs> like, like, till like it's all the juices. You gotta get all the juices. But um, um, it, it's interesting because I, I didn't know what the I didn't know what the topic was. But even while I was at home, the topic was still similar to what I was doing while I was at home. And the day I today was interesting on the way here. <laughs> like how <laughs> like and it's funny you talking about this topic because you know I, if you look in Job 10, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I was when I was Sweet in Job. I was in when I was in the house. And you know, you'll see. You see, I'm talking about how God's clothed me with skin and flesh and has fenced me with bones and sinews. You know, Ezekiel 37 comes to mind about the dry bones, but it talks about the bones and the sinews and he's doing that. And that gives you a whole picture of uh, Israel and it's been raised from the dead after his actual firstborn son, Jesus, raised from the dead. So they died, they were, you know, a dead thing. Jesus died so that dead thing could then become a living thing. He, he took on uh, he took on saying we could become the righteousness in him like uh, 2 Corinthians 5 talks about that was another place 
that Noah's playing me at earlier with that. You know, we knew him after the flesh, but henceforth we don't know him no more after the flesh. Um, you know, again, we don't we judge not according to appearance, but we judge righteous judgment. <laughs> and so on the way here, you know, gave me an actual uh, uh, experience with it. Not me doing it, but somebody else doing it. It was like Tim said, you don't have to look righteous as you do. It's like you coming at somebody, you don't even know what God has just said about them before you even just met them on this way. I'm walking. <laughs> I'm walking. I'm coming down. I'm coming down. Uh, I see these dudes, I see these guys standing on the side. They got all back, they got the same gear on. I'm like, God, let's get close. I'm like, this one is good. They was about to walk and go across the street. I'm like, oh, all right, cool. I can go on straight through. Man, no. This dude was probably like, no, nah, boy. They turned around. Like, I was like, honey. And then they, they got to trying to say something. And when they were about to hand a paper, it was like it came to me who the group was. See, they weren't wearing their usual purple color. I said, they done got a little smooth or nothing. Oh, wow. So I'm like, ah. I'm like, all right, well, you get some. So I was like, I'll grab the paper. Let me see what, let me listen. Let me see they going to say. They went in and trying to talk about uh, trends. I was like, oh, hey. <laughs> hey. Numbers 1538. Yeah, numbers 1538. Then they started, they started trying to say, oh, you know, you don't have that. You know, it ain't, you know, you like keeping the command. Like, and then they want to say, uh, you know, you know, we Judah, right? So first, of course, it came with that first. Wait a minute, you didn't have all your you don't have all your nah, on today. That. Okay. Uh, yeah. Pray the Lord. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's time to Let's because go. it's time to learn about. Cause it's time to learn about walking in the spirit. Yes. You get it? It's like, okay. But what does that mean? They want you the one with Zephaniah 1 and 8, the one about strange apparel. I was like, oh. And they're talking about the wedding garment. I was like, oh, you want to go to the one about the wedding garment? In my head, I ain't mean, mm -hmm. The one with the wedding garment? It's like he's talking about the Holy Spirit. You know what you're talking about? You could have went to 2 Corinthians 5. Didn't go there, but that's where we've been too. Mm -hmm. He said that we be clothed upon. He talking about with your house in heaven. He talking about with the new body. He talking about when he goes to another body in Galatians and he say uh, circumcision. Mm -hmm. He say circumcision, no uncircumcision. It don't avail as much. He said, but Christ, but a new creature. Mm -hmm. He said, but faith yeah. which worked by love. Didn't even get on the fact that, and then, then that anyone ran all up. A man done, uh, a man done, uh, a man done taught you, you need to repent. So one of them was a young boy. And, it, it, and now that I think about it, make you think of Job. It was three of them. <laughs> Women, they said a man taught you, you need to repent. They try to say it. I, I'm just asking, is that what they said? Yeah. Were they men? One was, were, they teaching, yeah, yeah, were, they, were, they, were they teaching you? Were they calling themselves teaching you? Call themselves. Yeah, but do, 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 do you understand the irony? If a man is taught you, you need to repent. <laughs> Just because a man taught you, but you a man, you trying to teach me. Yeah. I'm about to repent again, Ma. I just repent. No, what he said, what, what he said was like, now he said, he said, talking, talking about letting no man deceive you. So I said, yeah, let no man deceive you. Because the group you under, that's a straight cult. Now who did that? You probably been wanting to fight. Didn't even get on that one. Yeah. Didn't even you know what time to go on it because they're going to walk. I was like, oh, okay. Didn't even get on that one that you straight up in the cold. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't play. And I was like, hey, because the Lord ain't, ain't playing with y'all whole little group. Don't do that right now. Because first it's like, yeah, hit it. Because it's talking about the Sabbath. You know, because it was like, you know what the day is? I was like, the Sabbath. Because it was like, okay, y'all got your friends, you got your little crew. So it already finna go how it's finna go. And so I guess they just thought, I guess they just thought them. Already had me do that stuff and go yeah. through the bondage of being on the extra stuff y'all doing already. If you was gonna listen, you could get free right now. Free. So it's like, come on. So it's like, well, you know, going to a Sabbath study right now. Y'all come on with me. Like, I was like, hey, come with it. Cause I was like, they come here. They were gonna get it today. They came here today. Cause now that I came in here, I'm like, ooh, they came. They would have gotten a car. I was holding them following with the car. I was like, gonna follow, follow with the car. Well, we can get the, 
we can get down, you can hear it too. I was like, oh, this would have been pretty. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, so one of them was, boy, he looking hard. Because one of the dudes, he said, this is my son right here. Because they tried to say, you know, in Numbers 15, 38, you talk about throughout your generation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that can go with how he gave Phinehas an everlasting covenant. Indeed. But it was really an everlasting covenant if he's in, if you in Christ. If you in the covenant you gave to Aaron, that's in Christ. We under, we under the uh, order of Melchizedek. So we rule and reign, but we rule like that. He gave a spirit to us. He gave a law of mountain. He gave a spirit to us. Yeah. And like the one that was talking about living in newness of spirit. The letter killer, but the spirit give life. It's a greater covenant. So you don't back under that covenant, but that don't mean don't do what God said. It means do what God said and understand Jesus is your righteousness. You need to be clothed with him. Put on the Lord Jesus. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And be over there persecuting somebody you weren't supposed to persecute. Like he talked about in Galatians. If you would have known, you would have really known it was your brother. You wouldn't be talking stupid. Talking out the side of your neck. You didn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you better go ask God what he just said. Because clearly you ain't listening to him. We ought to obey God rather than man. Yeah. And with that one. Mm -hmm. you, you have to, and it's the young one. The young one want to say it. And it ain't but being a young, but it's like clearly... Your folks over here done told you, oh, they might not gonna say it like that. You might swing or they'll say it like that. Like, yeah, but, uh, but it wasn't even the worry of the fact that it just would have been, it would have had to been that. And the father just would have got at him because it would have been the wrong one to try. One of his sons for real. It's, yeah. Like, you just gotta know that. You just gotta know that. God, God, you just gotta know what they're they trying to get you up out of there on these jobs because you don't wanna do what man said. You gotta know God gonna protect you. God love you. God gonna show you the truth. He got you. 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 The arrow of deliverance. You should have shot five the same time. You should. You should have. And today was completely destroyed. You shouldn't have made no covenant with them, Israel, when you went in that land. You should have went to completely destroyed. He said seven nations, complete. That's complete. Seven. Completely destroy all of them, throw down all they idols, all they altars, all of it. All that you think is and that, it. And that's what you do down. under suzerain. Uh -huh. That's what you do under suzerain. You do not allow you go, any. You, go you don't allow any other sovereign to have any say so. I'm going to be talking about it more and more yeah, because. Hey. Because it's like, okay, we, 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 I, I, I can't feel comfortable with this church. It's churchy. You know, go get some of that chicken. I mean, it's greasy, but at least it might be more sanctified. But uh, it's churchy. Today, today is pretty cool. They didn't get over by Harrison Square. And it's us uh, some street preachers out there. But they was preaching right, though. Okay. It, I was like, I think, I was like, they should wander over there for they was it was not it was street preachers out there. And I was like, I was like, oh, this this interesting today. Everybody out preaching. And I said, okay, Lord, you just yeah. I've been thinking about it now. You know, because because that did it's like when that comes, it's like really it stir you up some more because it's like okay, look, if it, you're doing something right actually, you're doing yeah, something right when it happens. Yeah. If you get first, you did something right actually. For it, it's like you don't even know the prayer you, you put it and do all that, all of that. Oh yeah, you know, you know we right, and, and it go back to this. If you know the truth, the truth make you free. If you know Him, you experientially know Him. You talking about the shadow, the type in the shadow. What was the type in the shadow talking about? You talk about the ribbon of blue in there. What is that really point? The sky is blue too. Both on that yeah. witness is the thing you see in the heavens do what God's saying. You didn't even know why he let me put on blue today. You want to do all that? How about you ask that then? Ask some questions. You want to get on that. You went to doing all that extra stuff. Didn't know what you was talking about. You were dead. You, you want to do all that? Okay, be a dead to do the whole lot. Tell me you did all that. Because you said we don't have to do this like this. Uh, like that anymore. We do spiritual sacrifices now. You said that. You said Hebrews ten. You said hey, Hebrews eight. But don't then. But don't then twist it. Because mm -hmm. you didn't. Because you didn't. Because you went went behind the veil yet. Mm -hmm. So you like Second Corinthians three. You still ain't seen it. Do you think that there been every who had on fringes? Huh? Do you think that there been every yeah. who had on fringes? Yeah. 
Yeah, probably. Oh, no, yeah, because I had a hat on. He won't get on that. They, they won't go to 1 Corinthians 11 and talk about your head being covered. I said, please break that down all the way. Please break that down all the way. Which is really like that. Like, really, if you're going to talk, break it down spiritually. Did he have locks? Now the guy that said he, no. Did any of them have locks? No, I don't think so. I think one of the F on the other one. Come one on. might have, but he, yeah. but he had like nothing. Well, you know, they, but it's like you said. they had bonnets and they had miters. They had the head covered. Yeah. And as I was on the way walking, I was like, the priest said that. The priest said that. And then, oh, and, and then the Sabbath was like, you can't buy your son. I'm thinking in my head, yeah, that's what it says. Look. And then when I get a little further on, I'm past the gym, but and me, of course, this law would have do good on yeah. the Sabbath. I'm like, okay, Lord, thank you for the, the, the teaching on that one. That, that, that's a credit to teach you when it's just out of nowhere. It literally is out of nowhere. It literally is out of nowhere. As I'm standing there, it, does, it didn't even feel right. It was like when you design, you feel it. Mm -hmm. Like whatever, something, messing with whatever is on them. So it's coming. Ain't it. So it's coming, it's coming to gain the strong in there. That's the second time I've seen that. that they they traveled for the Sabbath day church. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did you, you, you have your gas? Did you have I, I thought Petra said they were in a car. Oh, y'all got in a car. Oh, y'all got in a car. Y'all seen them walk up to the floor and I said, y'all got in a car. They just started, like, started a fire, right? It is a combustion engine. Hey, hey, y'all. I'm gonna I'm 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 close this out if we want to keep talking. We can't have to. I'm gonna close okay. this out. Yeah. May the Most High bless us, keep us, make His glorious, precious face to shine upon us. Be gracious to us. Help us realize what covenant we have in Him, and that we will do everything we can to extend Your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Even so, Amen. Shalom.